What would you do for your family? What would you sacrifice for your country? What would you do for a million pounds? Interesting questions, aren't they? If the answer to any of these questions is anything, then you've just revealed the most important thing in your life. I have a vague memory as a child of sitting, playing on the living room floor, probably with some Lego in hand, while on the TV, Charlton Heston and Yul Brenner brought to life one of the most well-known stories in human history in the silver screen epic, The Ten Commandments. In our first video in this series, we looked at the way God chose to introduce himself to his people as he gave them these commands. And through his introduction, God set the context for which all the commands should be understood. God is a loving God who desires people to live free from slavery of sin, to live in a way that is good for themselves and good for other people. God is not in the business of trying to control people. He simply wants each of us to live our lives experiencing the freedom we were created for and to enjoy perfect relationship with one another, the world around us, and with God himself. And it's into that context that God spoke the Ten Commandments. The first of which is recorded for us in the book of Exodus in chapter number 20 and verse 3, and it simply says, you shall have no other gods before me. The Bible then goes on to talk about images and idols in the next commandment. And when we read that, it's easy to take this first statement and think that it only applies to gods that the ancients worshipped, the gods of the wind and the rain, gods like Zeus, Apollo and Ra. And while it certainly did and does apply to those kinds of gods, the commandment goes much, much deeper than that as well. In our increasingly secular society, it's easy to dismiss this commandment as irrelevant for a godless age, but to do so would really miss the point. See, this first commandment is in a lot of ways the mother of all the commandments that follow. There is only one God and he is the creator of all peoples. He is father to all. There is one moral standard revealed in the following nine commandments and explained in the fullness by Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, and that applies to all people for all time. And the truth is that today there are as many false gods as there were on earth 4,000 years ago when these commandments were first received by Moses. It's just that we, with our Western 21st century minds, perhaps don't perceive the things that we worship as a god in the same sense that we might if we were born in that time. But the fact is that you don't need me to tell you that things like money, power, success and celebrity can and all too often do become gods in people's lives. That's what causes people to contemplate and even go through with suicide attempts when stock markets crash and family members die and illness strikes and jobs are lost. Whatever we make the object of our desires in essence becomes the God that we begin to worship. Think about it. If I make the acquisition of wealth my driving force in life, I begin to worship, to fixate on and obsess over the thought of getting and having more money. This in turn might lead me into believing, thinking, saying and doing all sorts of things in the pursuit of the desire to become rich. Maybe I'd be willing to compromise on certain things, willing to do something I knew to be wrong to get what I desire to have. Maybe fill out a form in a certain way to game a system. Maybe over embellish or just downright lie on a CV to make it more likely that I get the job that pays a bit better. Maybe the thing I really crave is power, so I'll do anything I can, say anything I need to, even if I know it to be false or something I don't believe in, to manipulate people into giving me power over them. The problem is that when we make these things the desires of our hearts, we elevate them into a place where they begin to affect all our other relationships. You see this most obviously in the behaviour of those with drug and alcohol addictions who often turn to theft to support their habits, sometimes even stealing from their own family. 
And as we elevate these things into a position that they should never be allowed to occupy, far from empowering us, far from fulfilling us or making us feel good about who we are, far from positively impacting our relationships with other people, they actually enslave us. And we can become prisoners of our own desires, trapped in unhealthy cycles of self-abuse and abuse of others as we frantically scramble around, doing whatever we have to, even things we know to be wrong, in the service of the thing we've made our God. Our willingness to compromise and to embrace things we know to be wrong in service of these gods becomes a twisted expression of our worship to them. And the really complicated thing is that it's not just things that we might think of as bad, like the pursuit of power, that can become our gods. But good things can as well. Things like our family, our jobs, our intellect and even love can all become gods in our lives. See, a man who elevates his job above all else will neglect his family. A man who elevates uh, her, his children, above all else, will do anything, no matter how bad, to protect them. A politician whose primary goal is power and not service will say and do anything she has to to achieve it. The Christian thinker St Augustine called these things disordered loves. Elevating anything, no matter how good, no matter how noble, into the position that should be occupied by God will inexorably lead us to compromising on what we know to be right and will result in bad things happening to us and to those around us. When God makes his first commandment to his people to have no other gods before me, he's saying you need to put me first because everything else in your life is designed to flow out of your relationship with me. You see, when you put God first and you make your relationship with him your greatest desire, you position yourself for success in all your other relationships. And you do so in a way that doesn't lead you to compromising on what you know to be wrong. The reason God makes this his first commandment is that all the other commandments flow out of this one. They all find their basis and have their foundation in our relationship with God. And in the same way, as we choose to give God the number one place in our lives, above family, above friends, our jobs and our finances and everything else, the rest of our lives flow out of our relationship with God. When God says, you shall have no other gods before me, he's not saying it for his own benefit, but for ours. God is a good father. He wants the best for his children. And what's best for us begins with putting God at the top of the pile in our lives. When we do that, everything else in our lives is informed by him. Family, friends, love, jobs, happiness, money, education are all important and good things. But none of them should be the most important things in our lives. God reserves that place for himself and he alone. And he does that because he loves us. If you've enjoyed this video, we'd really love you to head over to our website and connect with us. At Life Church, we've created The Journey, which is a great place to begin your journey with God or to find out more. We want to help you, resource you, encourage you, and equip you so that you can discover who God created you to be. As well as that, you can find out more about everything we do on our Facebook and YouTube pages. We look forward to hearing from you.